Okay, so we're now on this uh, third lesson in this unit on uh, taking a fresh look at the Ten Commandments. And we've studied uh, four commandments, and today we're going to study the fifth commandment, uh, honor your parents. So let's go ahead and start then with Exodus uh, 20, verse 12, and then we'll look at uh, 2 Samuel 15, uh, verses 7 to 14. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. All right, so uh, the word honor there uh, means more than just obedience. Uh, obviously, it entails obedience, but to honor a parent also means to give them a place of superiority. In other words, to hold them in high esteem, to reverence them, and uh, respect them in every every way. Uh, so immediately now, um, there are children out there, no matter what age, whether they're young or young adult, or even you know 60 ish and, and over. Uh, we have to include other biblical precepts as well. You know, it's pretty hard to revere a parent that has been abusive or is abusive. And uh, so, parents. We have a great responsibility uh, of raising our children to respect and obey. And, uh, you know, by living a godly uh, life or being a godly example before them. Because um, uh, respect uh, does have to be earned. I mean, all the Bible principles are included here in that parents have got to do their job before you can expect uh, children then to honor the parents. Uh, but I'll have more to say about that too. Um, anyway, honoring your parents. That's the that's the, the point we're trying to make here. Uh, so the other part of this verse also needs comment that thy days be long. All right? And so the implication there is children would live long lives if they honored their parents. Well, we know from observation and experience that parents have buried their children who didn't live long yet were parent honoring kids. And so uh, the promise here has more um, to do with a national promise rather than a personal one. Uh, the phrase long upon the land uh, to me um, could easily refer to the nation's days. And so in a society in general then, if the family unit is the foundation and that goes well and then uh, children grow up honoring their parents, the parents do their job, and this continues, then you'll have a society then that is very stable, and the then that nation then would have long days, and, and citizens would uh, generally be you know, obedient children. Uh, that seemed to suddenly change in the 1960s though. All right, so our best example always is Jesus Christ, right? And so in Luke 2, uh, verse two, uh, 52, uh, we read that uh, Jesus uh, went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. So here's Jesus then, you know, God in human form, but in his humanity, he was obedient uh, to his mother and his father. And no doubt, Joseph and Mary were very godly uh, parents. So here's a situation where the parents are doing their job Junior was doing what he was supposed to do as well. And even on the cross, um, he honored his mother. Apparently, Joseph had, had died. And so he honors his mother by providing for her needs in his absence because he tells John, uh, the beloved uh, disciple, to take care of his mother um, because he's going to be dying. And so it is sad, though, to see the almost universal disregard of this fifth commandment in our day. Uh, it is most certainly a sign of times. You know, over 1,800 years ago, it was prophesied that in the last days, perilous times will come, and men shall be lovers of themselves. They'll be covetous, boasters. They'll be proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unfaithful, ungrateful, unholy, without natural affection. So unquestionably, uh, the blame for most of this lies uh, on the parents. I mean, parents
parents have a huge responsibility and it appears that uh, this role has been abdicated uh, to a large extent. And, and men, um, it is especially um, our fault in that men have not been the godly spiritual leaders that they should have been in uh, these past years. And so men have neglected the moral and spiritual training of their children. And, uh, and now we're seeing that the children are not um, respecting or honoring their parents with all that going on. So it works both ways. And um, I'll have uh, more to say about that in a few minutes. So let's look at some further observations on this verse. Uh, the, command, the commandment is from God, and so it has the same weight of being uh, one of the Ten Commandments, just like the other nine. And so there is a reason then that God commanded um, children to honor their parents. And so the command then is irrespective of our parents' personal merits or demerits. And so I've already said that the parents' responsibility is to do their job right, but when we look at this um, commandment at point blank range, um, it doesn't say honor your parents if they earned it. Uh, it doesn't say honor your parents if uh, they merited it or don't honor them if they demerited it. It says honor your parents. And so that means to obey them. Now, obviously, uh, that also needs qualification, right? Because no child is under any obligation to obey their parents if it's an unlawful uh, thing. And so there's always, you know, you've got to take it in the right context too. And um, another thing I would say about this is that uh, honoring your parents means that we would do what we can for them. Okay, so, you know, just some examples. Um, I have twin boys and they routinely tell me, said, Dad, now if I can help you out, you know, do something, just let me know. And uh, so sometimes I'll just tease uh, Justin in particular because he lives close by. And I said, well, why don't you come cut my grass? He said, well, I'll do it, I'll do it. I said, no, you ain't. <laughs> I can cut my own grass. And now the day may came, come when I can't cut my own grass, and then I'll gladly, you know, that'd be a good idea if you cut my grass for me. But uh, I hope to be like uh, Uncle Jesse. You know, he's 80-something, and I bet you he's still in good enough shape to cut his own grass. So anyway, you do what you can for him. And so, um, that, and so in honoring your parents, it always means that you're looking for opportunities then to do what you can for them. Uh, honoring your parents means don't annoy them. <laughs> don't annoy them. In other words, you're always like uh, nagging or complaining about how rough you've got it. I mean, you come over to visit your parents and oh, that job just beating me down and the children aren't doing what they're supposed to do and just constantly don't annoy your parents. I mean, you've got responsibility, you know, you need to live up to it. So um, obey them and things lawful. Uh, do what you can for them. Don't annoy them. And uh, relieve burdens if possible. You know, make some sacrifices for them. And this could probably, the best examples are, are getting into the health care um, area where you may have parents that need um, um, taken to the grocery store or taken to the doctor's office. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities along those lines to help relieve their burdens. Uh, make sacrifices for them. Uh, so children should remember that the parents uh, have age and experience on their side. And so take advantage of that. You know, one of the things I, I've told my children over time, and it didn't matter what stage they were, um, I could always say, for example, I've been 20, you ain't been 45. And so no matter how old they get or how old I get, uh, that's a general principle in that I've lived longer, I've experienced more, seen more, and so uh, listen to your parents' advice. Also, uh, children, uh, remember the sacrifices that your parents have made and uh, typically and generally parents have sacrificed to the extent that you don't have a clue and so just remember that they have made great sacrifices for you 
And uh, here's, here's another thing. Um, I may not can find any scriptural basis for this, but it sure sounds good, and it is my opinion. Your parents <clears throat> probably love their children more than the children love their parents. And uh, I know that might stump people, but just think about that. The sacrifices that uh, mom and dad have made for the children and then um, think about sometimes how the, the children are ungrateful and unappreciative they don't get the sacrifice they've made and so when you look at it from that standpoint I think I can safely say and defend it that parents love their children more than the children love their their parents I think that's generally so uh, the sacrifices that parents have made on behalf of their children is often unappreciated. And it may be years and years before they catch on. Uh, so another point to, I wanna make here is that uh, let's don't leave mom out. Uh, it does say honor father and mother, but lots of times dad is sort of the focus. And so let's not leave uh, mom out. Uh, it says father and mother. And so mom is certainly not in obscurity here. And um, Last thing I want to say about this is it says honor father and mother, uh, not because uh, the children said so, but because God said so. This, this is a commandment. Uh, this is God's idea. And God's got it in there for a reason. So I'm sure there are many examples of um, grown children having a very difficult time honoring their parents. Uh, but for those that have uh, children at home, just remember, uh, that you uh, will one day be old and uh, you're teaching your children right now how to treat you when you get older. And so it'd be a good idea to keep that in mind too. All right, now uh, the Bible then flips over to uh, 2 Samuel. The lesson does uh, 2 Samuel 15, verses 7 through uh, 14. And so here's, here's the story of Absalom and his rebellion. So let's just read it. Uh, first, and then we'll go back like verse by verse. Uh, so it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I vow to the Lord, for your servant vowed a vow while I dwelled in Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said, Go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited, and they went along innocently and didn't know anything. Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileadite, David's counselor from his city, naming them Gileadite, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. And the messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or else we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Ah, right, now, you know, some background. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, King Saul dies. Uh, David is anointed king over Judah in chapter 2. David becomes king over all Israel in chapter 5. Uh, David has great military victories in chapters 5 through 10, and then uh, David's great sin of adultery and murder occurs in chapter 11. Uh, David repents in chapter 12, and then trouble in David's family uh, begins. Um, uh, Amnon, one of his sons, rapes his half-sister Tamar, and then Absalom avenges that by killing Amnon. And then Absalom then flees to Syria. And then he returns in chapter 15, but he's a rebellious young man. So in verses 7 through 12, um, talks about how Absalom then starts behaving. And so honoring parents certainly uh, requires being truthful and having integrity. And so Absalom has absolutely lost it. Lost it. There, there seems to be a, absolutely no natural affection left here at all. Uh, so after Absalom kills Amnon for raping Tamar, 
he, he fled and was gone three or four years. And in chapter 14, Absalom returns to the king and, uh, and Absalom uh, and the king don't see each other for two years. And so he's dwelling back in Jerusalem but, um, or in the area, but they don't visit with each other. So I think there's still some you know, anxiety and stress going on there. Uh, so in the meantime, Absalom then, apparently, he doesn't like how things are going. And so he, he doesn't like how his dad, uh, King David, is ruling. And so as the heir, uh, he doesn't uh, want to wait his turn, so to speak. So he begins this uh, deceitful campaign then to win the hearts or win the favor of the people of Israel. Uh, and the end game uh, being to undermine his father's rule, usurp his father's position, and to become king. You know, he didn't want to be king later. He wanted to be king now. And so here's a very elaborate scheme then to usurp his father's authority and his kingship. Verse 7 says that after 40 years. Now, in my mind, obviously that's that's an error. And maybe you say, oh, it's, there's an error in the Bible? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, I mean... Absalom was born after David was king. And the Bible tells us that King David reigned about 40 years. And so when you put all several other things together, basically what you've got here is it should have been four instead of 40. And so there's a typo. There's a copy error here. The only thing that would make sense is if you read four. Now my Bible, King James, New King James, does say 40. But I have other copies of the Bible, other translations, and it says four. And that does make perfect sense to me. Most Bible scholars that I study uh, totally agree. All right? So it just doesn't seem reasonable, from, even from the standpoint of Absalom was born after David was king. Um, so he couldn't have been gone for 40 years. And so, you know, other verses talk of Absalom being gone uh, three years, three to five years, and when he comes back, he didn't see his father for a couple. And so 40 just really doesn't make sense here, but four years would. All right, verse 8, Absalom says to his father, King David, he says, you know, while I was in Syria, I made this vow to the Lord that if I was to return to Jerusalem, that I would serve the Lord. Well, obviously, that was a um, false piety. Um, he, he, he's using God's name in vain. You know, we've seen, already seen that uh, commandment. That he's using God to, to manipulate. And so he's using religion or using God's name to manipulate his own dad. So while I was in Syria, I made this vow that if I get to come back, then I'll serve the Lord. And so he asked then permission from his father uh, to go to Hebron. Now Hebron is his birthplace. So I guess it had um, significance to him. It's a strategic location. It's about uh, 20 miles south of Jerusalem. And so there's a lot of reasons why he would want to go there. Uh, he would be able to um, start his deceitfulness, and, um, but yet be close enough to Jerusalem to send spies. I mean, so all this adds up that he would want to go there. Uh, but so David, you know, Okay, okay, sounds good to me. And so he, he allows Absalom to go and basically with his blessings says, you know, go in peace. And so Absalom then goes to Hebron to start an insurrection that apparently he'd been planning, uh, you know, for at least four years. Now, verse 10, 11 tell us, tells us that he invited 200 men to go with him. And these probably were strategic uh, men, men of great leadership, maybe military men. But they didn't know that they were going to be used to be a party to the insurrection. And so he deceived those guys too. So here's an elaborate deception going on. He deceives his, his father. He deceives his 200 men. Uh, verse 12 tells us that Absalom was also successful in getting Ahithophel to join him. And uh, Ahithophel uh, was one of David's most trusted advisors. And so the Bible doesn't specifically say uh, why Ahithophel threw David under the bus, but um, you know, you read and study all of it out, uh, we know that Ahithophel was likely Bathsheba's granddad. 
And so there that is. And so here's a good point then to make that uh, David ain't perfect. He was certainly a man after God's own heart. But uh, making mistakes like that or sinning like that always has consequences. So, so you have to wonder if um, because David done that, then he sort of lost his integrity with his son. And now Ahithophel, in my mind, is like, I, I need revenge. And so he agrees to go with Absalom then to be a part of the insurrection. Now that's just plain bad judgment. That's just plain bad judgment. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are because in the end, Ahithophel hangs himself because the rebellion doesn't work out like he thought. Uh -huh. So revenge never works out for you. So if you've got that on your heart or in your mind, just take it from what the Bible has to say, all the examples in the Bible, and of course God being against it as well. Revenge or vengeance is something that's in God's hand, not yours. And it's not going to work out well. And so don't be planning no vengeful or revengeful um, stuff against people that's done you wrong. Uh, you know, they, maybe they did do you wrong. But uh, you will pay if you take that into your own hand. All right, so in verses uh, 13 and 14, um, you know, the Bible says that uh, it, it all starts coming about. And it's getting obvious now what's going on. And so David learns of the treachery and the, the treason and the rebellion of his son Absalom. And so uh, it looks like he makes an immediate decision. And I'm sure that these decisions come pretty fast. And so David flees from his beloved Jerusalem. I mean, he just runs away. And so this is humiliating. Absolutely humiliating. And uh, here, here's an example of David is eating humble pie. And when it's time to eat that pie, eat it. It will always work out best. Uh, if you need a dose of humility, just go ahead and eat that humble pie. I guarantee you, not based on what I got to say, but based on the authority of the Word of God, it's always take the high road, right? Take the high road and uh, you eat that humble pie. So this is humiliating. He, he flees into the wilderness, but it really does show uh, David's character, that he is a man after God's own heart. And so then we ask, well, how do we see that in verse 14? Well, we don't. But if we study Psalms, um, I wrote them down here, uh, let me see, what, 3, 4, 27, 31, 41, 43, 51, 55, and 63, those, uh, we find all the support that we need for David's character. That he is a man after God's own heart. Because all these psalms were written under the pressure of this great humiliation. And it shows us uh, David's uh, confidence and his faith in God and an assurance that God's uh, presence is there, that God's protection is there, that God has not left him or abandoned him. And so, you know, David could have easily said, oh my goodness, what in the world's going on here? And turns his back on God. God, why, why are you allowing this to happen? You ever heard that? You ever said that of yourself? Now, God, uh, David maintains his integrity here. And he knows that God has made him some promises. And that he's going to hang his head hat on those promises. Now, that's feel good advice. And so he has all faith. He has all confidence in God. He's assured of God's presence. He's assured of God's protection. Um, chapter 21, Psalms, tells us of his anguish over Ahithophel's treachery. But even though you read that and he's anguished over it, there, there's no fear in David's writing. No fear whatsoever. You know, he's, he's upset about it, but he's, he's not scared. No, no fear there. In Psalm 41 and 43, uh, tell us of his firm faith that God was still his mighty and strong power. Psalm 3 and 4 tells us of his fleeing from his own son Absalom and uh, his thoughts and emotions there. Uh, Psalm 41 and 45 tells of his of the panic uh, when that news reached him in Jerusalem and, and the grief 
of, of what had happened and transpired. I mean, immediately when he got that news, it's like, okay, everything sort of lined up in his mind. You ever, you ever done that in that you had that light bulb experience and then the light bulb comes on and then all of a sudden in almost a matter of seconds, like, okay, all those things it makes perfect sense now. So all the, all the four or five years now that Absalom has been uh, planning this deception, it all immediately makes sense to David. And so he immediately knows what he's got to do. And so there is pretty much an instantaneous um, action going on here. Psalm 51 tells us of his uh, casting his burden upon the Lord and the Lord was sustained. Psalm 27 tells us of the inconsistency, and get this, the inconsistency of man versus the abiding goodness of God. You can always count on that. Both of them. Man, your best friend, your spouse, will let you down. Count on them. They're human. They will let you down. Now, they may not intend to. Uh, it may not be their intention at all, but they will. Um, but God won't. Uh, you know, man, your best friend, your spouse, they're, they're human. They can't do what God can do. And there'll be uh, emotional reasons, intellectual reasons, physical reasons, all kinds of reasons why man will fail you. So what I'm saying is they won't intend to or mean to, but they will. And so Psalm 27 tells us then of the inconsistency of man versus the abiding goodness of God. You can always count on God. Always. All right? Now, sometimes we don't understand, right? But that don't mean you can't depend on him. God is good all the time. We're the ones that have the problem with God's mysteries. You know, we don't... We, we can't understand his thoughts. Our thoughts ain't his thoughts. He sees the whole picture, we don't. He said, don't, you don't have to understand it. I don't expect you to understand it. There's still mysteries there nobody understands. He said, trust me. And, and God said, I'm good. And so let's leave that right there. But the birth, Psalm 27 tells all about that. All right, so in all these Psalms then, the point here is that we see David as the one who was totally dependent on God. David's character comes out. And this is why the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah, he failed. But listen, let's don't dwell on what he done wrong. Why don't we dwell on what he done good? He done a lot of things really, really well. And uh, yes, he failed in that category. It cost him family issues. There's no doubt about that. There were consequences. But, um, and so we can then use that as an example of uh, parents will fail. Well, let's don't dwell, children, let's don't dwell on the fact that, oh, they messed up that one time and then not honor them um, from them, that point forward. Listen, you're going to mess up too as children. Uh, you're going to have your own children. And so we all mess up. Now we all, listen, man is a sinful thing. And, and we're all going to fail, all right? So let's don't dwell then on those things. Let's dwell then on the good things, all right? So all those Psalms, we see David as the one who was totally dependent upon God and he had given all his heart to God. Now, it may seem strange, and I've already hinted at this, that David would flee Jerusalem. I guess, cut and run, pick up and run. Um, but you say, well, didn't he have an army there? Well, he may not. I mean, he, he'd been out on military. His army's about to be out. All right? And so, um, according to Psalms 51 and 55, you read those, the fortifications at Jerusalem were not complete. And even if the fortifications were good, a siege would ultimately be what Absalom would do. I mean, he, that guy's smart too. And so staying is really not a good idea. David was a, was a brilliant military man too. He instantly knows that staying is not a good idea. 
even if you had an army. All you got to do is lay siege to the city. You know, it takes time, but you cut the food and water off, and after a while, you come out and put your hands up. Uh, uh. And so that would lead to sure defeat. And besides, if David, and if you did have an army in Jerusalem, that means Absalom's got control and power and authority over all the rest of the country. And so it's just not a good idea strategically uh, to stay. And that's why David um, flees. So fleeing into the wilderness then will buy him time. And I think that um, David's uh, strategy is, you know, avoid the siege, buy some time, and then the rest of the country is going to wake up and reflect upon what David has done versus what Absalom has done, or any other for that matter. All right. Another key thing that David has is Joab. Now, Joab is like a, a general pat. He is a great general as well. Now, Joab had his faults too, and so I'm not just building him up, but Joab is a great general, and so he would be more than a match for Absalom. So in fleeing into the wilderness, uh, David has done absolutely the right thing. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, um, it's not in our lesson, but the end game is that we see that David and Joab have used the forest of Ephraim, which is a very rugged terrain, and they use it to their advantage. And uh, 20,000 of Absalom's men are killed in that, that one battle. And pretty much that, that ends it because Absalom begins to flee. And remember, the Bible says that it, his head or hair gets tangled up in the oak tree and Joab comes upon him and kills him. And see, uh, David had told everybody, y'all be gentle with Absalom. You know, don't, don't hurt him. You know, he's still my son. But Joab kills him anyway. And so... So Joab, like I said, a great military general, but uh, he, he went against David's will on that, and he done some other things that weren't quite right. All right, so the rebellion is over. Now, let's look back in and now and see how do we apply all this. You know, the lesson is all about having um, a respect and honoring your parents, and so we have Absalom then, who is the, the epitome of dishonoring his parents, you know, particularly his father. So he deliberately plans the overthrow of his father's kingdom in order to gain, uh, be king himself. He does it over an elaborate uh, scheme of four years period of time. During this time, he criticizes the king, he unbinds the king, his administration, and uh, he, he professes a false sympathy uh, to win the hearts of the people. You know, he tells them uh, what they want to hear. That's like a politician, isn't it? And so, he, and he uses God as a part of his, his ruse uh, by vowing to serve God if he's allowed to uh, return to Jerusalem and, and Hebron. And uh, he, he arranges to have these spies in Jerusalem. He convinces Ahithophel to betray his father, the king. And so, uh, this is nothing but blatant vanity and, and a lust of power. And so, not to mention his conceit, uh, he was really conceited. Absalom was a very handsome uh, dude, and so he used that uh, to his advantage. He used his good looks. He was conceited. So he was conceited, he was deceitful, he used flattery, he was ambitious, overly ambitious, and he was sure enough a hypocrite. And so here is a picture of a man that has lost all natural affection for his father. Absalom has uh, ridiculed and criticized his father's rule and was willing to crush his father's uh, hopes and dreams and his whole life's work uh, in order to get back at him or to be king himself entirely selfish, right? And, and to do it to such a father. You know, I've always said David was not perfect. I mean, he, he did sin and there were lots of consequences. But uh, when we read all the other Psalms and all the other parts of the Bible concerning David, uh, certainly not perfect, but nobody was more generous and magnanimous or noble. And uh, he had brought peace and security and um, economic prosperity, a land of plenty. He had done all those things for Israel as well. So for Absalom, here's part of the point, reverence or honor of his father had gone. And then the love was gone. 
This is what happens in a society. When reverence for parents is gone, if you don't revere your parents, you don't revere authority, respect authority of any kind. The love goes, so reverence goes, the love goes, and then you get what Absalom done. This is what can result. But there's still hope for a, a child or, or uh, children if they revere and love um, their parents. Uh, but when these are gone, it games up. Uh, some other thoughts, and, and I'll close. Absalom was able to persuade a mass of people by God. That's right. History has shown us that the masses of people often don't think. I want to challenge you when you're watching the news and hearing people talk, listen for that word. I feel like that we should do, you know, fill in the blank. I feel emotions and feelings are fickle. They are real, not discounting them at all, but I'm telling you, uh, they're fickle. And, you know, people can get feeling like or get emotional and clever clever orators can stir up those emotions and feelings and so you know it's not always the best path or the best idea to follow the crowd to follow the masses now, you, you listen to that very carefully now um, popular opinion is not always right uh, the, the, the majority of the people are not always right I mean, you got to base this on what, what does the truth say? And where's the truth? Because listen to the Word of God. It don't matter what the, the news opinion is or what they feel like. The truth is what does say what the Word of God has to say. And so don't let your emotions or your feelings rule your opinions. You find out what the Bible has to say and you stick with that. And if everybody else is going down the wrong path, uh, you, you should be able to recognize that that's not always the best path. All right? Another point, and I'm, on, I'm quitting. <clears throat> Absalom is antagonizing the mortal king of Zion, David, but he's also antagonizing the immortal king of Zion, which is God. Now, that's not going to work out. That's not going to work out. In times like we're now living through, it is wise that we scrutinize the secret or hidden motives of rebellious behavior. Now, this is what's going on in our society right now. Here's what you stick with. Faith in God, belief in his word, coupled with patient persistence. And that's gonna accomplish a whole lot more than violence. And that's just plain good advice for our, today's climate.